Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome everybody to the fourth AALS awards ceremony. I am Mark Alexander, the AALS president and the dean of the Villanova University Charles Whittier School of Law. Today we honor excellence and leadership in legal education and we celebrate the many accomplishments of law school faculty over this past year. Every ALS president has the opportunity to pick a theme for the year and the annual conference. My theme for this past year has been defending democracy. It's the theme of the year and the theme of this annual meeting. In my inaugural address last year, I said that we, as law school faculty, are the shapers of the shapers, placing upon our shoulders a distinct responsibility to this country in ensuring that our democracy endures. The award winners that will be recognized this afternoon are faculty who are helping to shape the shapers. They are helping to shape the next generation of lawyers by their example and through their research, through their advocacy, their teaching, and through their action. So to get things started, in the spirit of honoring excellence in legal education, I would like to introduce my colleague, the chair of the ALS Committee to Review Scholarly Papers, Young Jae Lee, professor of law and associate dean for research at Fordham Law, who will present the awards from the Scholarly Papers Competition. Young Jae. Thank you, Dean Alexander. To encourage and recognize outstanding legal scholarship and to broaden participation by new faculty in ALS, the association conducts a scholarly papers competition for, for full-time faculty who have taught for five years or less. We're in our 38th year, and it seems to me that it is important for us to have more formal opportunities like this to define what excellence in legal scholarship looks like. This year we had 91 submissions to the competition from 74 ALS member law schools. A blind process was used to review the papers uh, with authors and school affiliation removed from the articles. I'd like to thank my outstanding colleagues on the committee to review scholarly papers who select the papers from the authors we are honoring today. And they are David Caudill of uh, the Villanova University Charles Weijer School of Law. Michael Coonan of Seton Hall University School of Law, Amanda Harmon Cooley of South Texas College of Law, Houston, Brittany Deitch of Capital University Law School, and last year's winner, Nicole Summers of Georgetown University Law Center. It was a pleasure working with all of you, and I believe I speak for the committee when I say that it was a pleasure reading all the submissions. There's a lot of good scholarship out there. And first, I would like to recognize two of the authors who received an honorable mention for the competition. First, we'd like to recognize the paper, Tradition in Constitutional Adjudication by Felipe Jimenez at the University of South Cal Southern California uh, Gould School of Law. Felipe could not be with us in person today, so he sent along some recorded remarks. Hi, this is Felipe Jimenez. I wanted to say, first of all, how sorry I am not to be able to join you in person at the annual meeting this year. I'm so sorry I'm going to miss the opportunity to see so many friends and colleagues, but I also wanted to express my gratitude for having received this uh, recognition by the committee for my paper, Tradition in Constitutional Adjudication. I also wanted to congratulate Professors uh, Panamarenko and Lohr were also being recognized in this opportunity. I should also thank my colleagues here at USC who have been extremely supportive ever since I started my career as a law professor. And I should also thank all of the colleagues and friends who read previous versions of this paper, helped me improve it with their insights and their feedback. So my paper is basically an attempt to use the tools of jurisprudence and legal philosophy to try to make sense and evaluate the court's recent use of the notion of tradition in the context of constitutional rights adjudication. 
And as I argue in the paper, my main point is that tradition as a notion cannot do the work that the court expects it to do. Tradition cannot produce judicial restraint. It cannot produce a clear decision procedure or a decision standard for constitutional rights cases. On the contrary, serious engagement with the notion of tradition shows that it opens up space for normative judgment and for judicial discretion. And so in light of that, we have two alternatives. One is to embrace that discretion. The other is to reject it. But if we want to reject it, as I argue in the paper, then what we need to do is not turn to this notion of tradition, but rather rediscover and re-emphasize the significance of the distinctive reasons provided by the legal tradition and the role of legal reasoning and legal expertise in constraining judicial decision-making, even in hard cases. And I think this kind of approach, on the one hand, preserves the idea of judicial restraint, but on the other, doesn't rely on this notion of tradition, which in the end doesn't produce any form of restraint. So my hope with this paper is that it will contribute to the ongoing debates about the recent traditionalist turn in the court's constitutional jurisprudence, and that it will hopefully help us understand and make more sense of how we should think of what courts do when they decide constitutional cases. So again, thank you so much for the committee. I'm sorry I can't be there. And congratulations again to Professors Ponomarenko and Lohr. Okay. Felipe stole my line by mentioning the other two winners. <laughs> So next, we'd also like to recognize the second honorable mention, the paper Disabling Families by Sarah Lohr at Brooklyn Law School. Thank you very much um, to Jay and also to the committee, certainly. Uh, I was very surprised uh, and very excited to be selected. Um, and I did not prepare remarks as an honorable mention, so I'll just say very few things. One, I don't know if Jamelia Morgan is here today, um, but I know she's in the, in the, at the conference, and I'm not sure if she's in the room, but um, Professor Morgan has just sort of guided me from the very beginning of my scholarship, and I feel extremely grateful to um, sort of follow in her footsteps and work, work alongside her. Um, Priyanka Nair has shaped nearly every thought I've had about disability, um, so thank you for that. Claire Huntington, who I know is not here, um, has been just an incredible mentor. And tomorrow I have the honor of, uh, and sort of luck, of presenting an award to Dorothy Roberts, who kind of created the field that I now write and practice in. Um, so it's really just, very lovely to be able to honor all of them alongside of this, um, because my work would not exist without theirs. Um, and thank you also to my colleagues at Brooklyn Law School um, for continuing to push me uh, to think and write more deeply. Um, my paper is called Disabling Families, and in very brief, uh, it argues that the family regulation system, also called the child welfare system, is an act active force in the production of disability. Um, and so I look at how it produces disability in three different ways in the families that it regulates uh, through constructing disability as a social, uh, social group, creating disability in the ways that it actively harms uh, and impairs those who are enmeshed in the system, and reinscribing it by failing to accommodate the parents themselves uh, with disabilities once they are drawn into the system, uh, and then using that as a reason to destroy their families. So it's obviously a paper about poverty, about race, and disability, and it's extremely meaningful to me to have uh, AALS recognize the importance of the field. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, and congratulations, Sarah. And this year's winning article is The Small Agency Problem in American Policing by Maria Ponomarenko at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Unfortunately, Maria couldn't be with us in person today, but she has also sent along some recorded remarks. 
Hi everyone. Uh, so first, I just want to say a huge thank you to the committee for all of the work that they did uh, to review the many submissions. Uh, and I also just want to say thank you to AALS for all of the work that the organization has done to lift up the work of junior scholars. Uh, this is a huge honor uh, to have my paper selected, uh, and I'm very sorry not to be there in person today uh, with all of you. My paper draws attention to what I call the small agency problem in American policing, namely the fact that policing in the United States is deeply fragmented across nearly 18,000 separate law enforcement agencies, the vast majority of which are small departments with a couple dozen officers at most. The reality is that we know very little about what policing looks like in these thousands of small departments. Policing scholars have tended to write primarily about the largest cities, gesturing only in passing to the fact that the issues they highlight and the solutions they propose may or may not apply to the thousands of departments that frankly look nothing like the sprawling agencies in places like Chicago and New York. Uh, so the goal of this paper was to start to develop at least a preliminary account of policing in small towns and rural areas and to explore the degree to which the familiar problems of big city policing tend to crop up in smaller departments as well. Uh, and I get at this question in two ways. So first, although we famously have very little data on policing, I leverage what data we do have to provide a broad overview of the nation's 12,000 small departments. In particular, I combine more than a dozen federal and state data sets that speak to various properties of small town departments, as well as the communities in which they work. I also draw extensively on various case studies of individual departments, as well as local government theory, to develop a roadmap of sorts for identifying the subset of departments that are most likely to engage in troubling practices. What I find is that there is indeed a distinct set of small agency problems in American policing, which differ in important ways from those that plague big city police. One problem that seems especially pronounced in smaller departments is the tendency to police in ways that externalize cost to, uh, the costs of policing uh, to people from outside jurisdiction. Using traffic stops, for example, I show that small town departments tend to make far more stops per capita than big city agencies, and that in many departments, the vast majority of people stopped do not in fact live in the jurisdiction itself. Now, as I point out in the paper, this is especially concerning because to the extent that officers may be making too many stops, writing too many tickets, or engaging in excessive force, it is highly unlikely that local political processes are going to get these problems under control. Another problem we miss by focusing on larger departments are the extreme resource constraints that some small agencies face. At just outside Pittsburgh, for example, there are at least a dozen small town departments in impoverished communities where officers make less than $15 an hour, working part-time, often picking up shifts in neighboring departments to try to make ends meet. Finally, another concern in smaller jurisdictions is the absence of the sorts of legal and political accountability structures, such as inspectors general, a robust media presence, or an active plaintiff's bar that can help nudge policing in the larger cities. Ultimately, I argue that for a variety of reasons, state intervention may be particularly warranted to address the problems that crop up in small town and rural departments. And then in the absence of this sort of external prodding, small jurisdictions may be even less likely than their big city counterparts to address these problems on their own. Uh, finally, I just want to say in closing uh, that this project is the first of what I see as a much broader research agenda at the intersection of policing and local government law. So to the extent these issues are of interest, I very much welcome comments on the paper and would be excited to discuss. Uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, congratulations again to all the honorees and please welcome back Dean Alexander for the next presentation. Thank you so much uh, and congratulations again to those wonderful uh, recipients and great uh, scholars. So next we're gonna turn to uh, sections and um, the ALS is um, an extraordinary organization, and when you sort of get inside the books, you see that the, 
faculty and staff and deans uh, engage throughout the year through 107, 107 sections. Uh, the sections actually present the majority of the programming uh, for the annual meeting. They provide mentorship for new faculty. They facilitate discussions on important legal issues. Uh, sections are also a wonderful way for faculty to continue to support each other by providing advice, hosting webinars on timely topics, and providing feedback on works in progress. You'll see the leaders of these sections in your programs, and I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, those leaders uh, for their outstanding uh, guidance, mentorship, and leadership. And now to present the Section of the Year Award, uh, please welcome the Chair of the AALS Committee on Sections, my terrific colleague, uh, Carrie Abrams from Duke University School of Law. Thank you so much, Dean Alexander, and good afternoon. It has been an honor to serve as the chair of the AALS Committee on Sections, and never more so than today, as I have the great privilege of presenting our award for Section of the Year. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the terrific work done by my colleagues on the committee who helped review many applications and nominations for this award. Jeremy Bach, Emilio Longoria, Jean Mazzo, Ebony Nelson, Matthew Seip, and Michael Waterstone. The Section of the Year Award was created in 2018 to recognize and celebrate excellence in member support and other activities that promote ALS's core values. This award has been presented annually since its inception. Most recently, last year in 2023, the Section of the Year was granted to the Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School and to the Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education. This year, we received a number of compelling nominations from some extremely deserving sections. But in the end, the work of one section in particular stood out, the section on alternative dispute resolution. Three aspects of the section's work that particularly impressed us were, first, the section's serious engagement with the theme of this year's annual meeting, Defending Democracy. Recognizing the need for education on how to engage productively across difference, the section put together a panel, Difficult Conversations in Polarized Times, which I think you can attend right after this awards ceremony if you would like to. We were impressed by the thoughtful topic selection, really a wonderful example of meeting the moment, and also with the section's outreach to multiple collaborators for co-sponsorship to broaden its impact across the conference. The second accomplishment that impressed us is actually a set of accomplishments. The section has a wonderful suite of programs that support scholarship both during the conference and throughout the year. They include a new mentoring program for junior scholars that actually includes uh, uh, money uh, that they raised that allows them to send their, their junior fellows to go meet with their, their mentors. Um, it also includes uh, a best article and dispute resolution program with which this year received 17 different nominations for the, for the best paper, and an annual works in progress conference. And then finally, if that weren't enough, we were also impressed by the service the section provided to its membership in light of the looming next gen bar exam, which will debut in July of 2026 and will include dispute resolution. Uh, as a bar exam topic. The section has responded nimbly uh, to this significant change, organizing a subcommittee to put together materials for faculty so that they can teach the skills necessary to make students successful on this portion of the new exam. So altogether, we felt that this section took seriously its leadership role, supporting AD the ADR community in the development of scholarship and teaching, while simultaneously sharing its expertise with the broader legal community, academic community, with all of us in a time in which this expertise is very much needed. So it's my great pleasure to present the 2024 AALS Section of the Year Award to the Section on Alternative Dispute Resolution, and here to accept the award on behalf of the section 
is its current chair, Professor Donna Chestowski of the University of California Davis School of Law. So much. I, I am so very honored to accept this award on behalf of the Section on Alternative Dispute Resolution. Thank you, Dean Abrams and the um, Committee on Sections for recognizing our work. The section on ADR is known for being a very active section. Uh, we are fueled by our great passion for the field of dispute resolution and the collaboration and community building values that we hold dear. This year, the executive committee worked especially hard, um, and so I'm thrilled to see our work celebrated uh, with this AALS honor. Uh, there are two people that I'd especially like to recognize, and so I ask that they please stand. Um, one is our chair regent or past chair, Deb Eisenberg from Maryland, and our chair elect, Kristen Blankley from Nebraska. Thank you for being so amazing, so amazing. <laughs> um, and other members of the executive board who are with us here today, could you please stand so that you can be recognized? I know there's several of you. Thank you. So terrific. Um, since I've been given the mic for roughly three minutes, um, I'd like to expand on some of the section developments uh, that Dean Abrams uh, touched on a little bit. Rather than summarizing everything that we worked on this year, which was a lot, um, I'm just going to showcase our two new initiatives, which are in addition to the Works in Progress conference that we have each fall that's hosted through competitive bid by different schools um, who are really uh, you know, into ADR, as, as we all should be, um, and our annual uh, Best uh, Awards program as well. Um, so as you may know, and I know you know, um, ADR is now going to be on the new bar exam, the NCPE's Next Gen Bar Exam. So one of our new projects involves creating a subcommittee dedicated to helping faculty across AALS sections as they prepare students for the new exam. So our Next Gen Bar subcommittee has been collecting a comprehensive set of teaching materials relevant to the intersection of ADR and a wide variety of courses, especially 1L courses. And this is being done under the leadership of Allison Carroll from Northwestern and Rachel Viscomi, who's here from Harvard. Um, and with the help of Sharon Press from Mitchell Hamlin, who's also on our executive board, we're working with the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law to create an online repository of these teaching materials. So these will soon be available for everyone through a searchable mechanism so that you can all uh, better prepare your students for the next gen bar exam and the practice of law from an ADR angle. Um, our second major initiative is dedicated to the professional development of junior scholars. We're calling this the New Voices in Dispute Re Resolution Program. So this is a year-long mentorship program in which an untenured or non-tenured track scholar um, it will be paired with a well-established mentor in the ADR field so that they can obtain feedback on one of their current projects. During the falls, mentors help them uh, you know, discuss their project and uh, work through the, the planning of it. Um, and in the spring, the mentor will host that junior scholar at their own institution to present the draft article. All of you will be invited to attend the online versions of those presentations sometime this spring. So I hope you'll welcome our new voices in that way by attending. Our final piece of news is that we do indeed have a great program planned and for the current annual meeting organized by section chair elect Kristen Blankley in line with this year's annual meeting, uh, meeting theme of def uh, defending democracy. It's going to be right around the corner at 3 p.m. And we have um, Sheila Heen uh, from uh, Harvard and Rachel Viscomi are going to be presenting on Difficult Conversations. Sheila Heen is one of the co-authors of this wildly popular book called Difficult Conversations, um, and we hope that you'll join us to hear more about how to navigate um, dialogue in politics, workplaces, and families. They're gonna be providing us with some constructive advice on how to do this well. So before I close, I just wanna express the Executive Committee's gratitude to everyone who dedicated their time and resources to our section initiatives this year, and to say how much we appreciate every single one of our section members. So if you were a member of the ADR section, do you mind just standing briefly so we can recognize you? All right, thank you. And if you're not standing up, that means you're missing out. We are a lot of fun, and I hope you join us uh, on, on this section. So thank you very much again for this wonderful award. Thank you. Congratulations, Donna, and all of the members of the winning section.
Sections also honor excellence in legal education in their various fields. So today we are honoring more than 60 outstanding individuals who were chosen by their ALS sections. If the honorees are with us today, we invite you to stand when you see your name on the screen so that we can recognize your accomplishments. The 2024 ALS Section Award winners are... Section on Academic Support Impact Award, Ashley London, Thomas R. Klein School of Law of Duquesne University. Section on Academic Support Legacy and Leadership Award, Russell McLean, University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. Section on Administrative Law Emerging Scholar Award, Todd Phillips, Georgia State University, Robinson College of Business. Section on Aging and the Law Emerging Scholar Award, Genevieve Mann, Gonzaga University School of Law. Section on Aging and the Law Lifetime Achievement Award, Lawrence Froelich, University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Section on Alternative Dispute Resolution Best Scholarly Article, Leslie Bellwood, Anthony Ostlin, Luegi Dressen, and Boylan, PA, and Mitchell Zamoff, University of Minnesota Law School. Section on Alternative Dispute Resolution, New Voices in Dispute Resolution Award. Ashley Vatruba, University of Nebraska Department of Psychology, and Henry Wang, Florida State University College of Law. Section on Animal Law, Excellence in Animal Law Scholarship Teaching Service Award. Stephen Wise, Non-Human Rights Project. Section on Antitrust and Economic Regulation Award. Harry First, New York University School of Law and William Kovacic, the George Washington University Law School. Section on Balance and Well-Being in Legal Education Annual Award, Marjorie Silver, Turo University, Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law Center. Section on Civil Procedure Junior Scholarship Award, Luke P. Norris, the University of Richmond School of Law. Runners up, Seth Endo, Seattle University School of Law and Monica Heyman, Harvard Law School. Section on Communication, Media, and Information Law Career Achievement Award, David Anderson, the University of Texas School of Law. Section on Comparative Law, Mark Tushnet Prize, Rose Ramo, Georgia State University College of Law. Section on Criminal Law, Junior Scholars Paper Competition, Anna Van Cleve, University of Connecticut School of Law. Runners up, Daniel Harawa, New York University School of Law, and Renee O'Leary, University of Wisconsin Law School. Section on Election Law, John Hart Ely Prize in the Law of Democracy, Richard H. Pildes, New York University School of Law. Section on Empirical Study of Legal Education and the Legal Profession, Judith Welch Wagner Award. Deborah Jones Merritt, The Ohio State University, Michael E. Moritz College of Law. Section on Evidence, John Henry Wigmore Award for Lifetime Achievement, Paul Rothstein, Georgetown University Law Center. Section on Family and Juvenile Law Achievement Award, Dorothy Roberts, University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School. Section on Federal Courts Best Untenured Article Award, Havon Adut, University of Virginia School of Law. Runner-up, Matthew Shapiro, Rutgers Law School. Section on Federal Courts Daniel J. Meltzer Award, Judith Resnick, Yale Law School, and Vicki Jackson, Harvard Law School. Section on International Human Rights Nelson Mandela Award, Dina Shelton, the George Washington University Law School. Section on International Law New Scholar Award, Melissa Stewart, University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law. Section on Jurisprudence Future Promise Award, Stephen Schaus, the University of Michigan Law School. Section on Jurisprudence Hart Dworkin Award, Benjamin Zapersky, Fordham University School of Law, and John Goldberg, Harvard Law School. Section on Jurisprudence Article Award, Courtney Cox, Fordham University School of Law. 
Section on Law and Religion Harold Berman Award for Excellence in Scholarship, Xiao Wang, University of Virginia School of Law. Section on Law and South Asian Studies Award, Deepa Dasa Savedo, Emory University School of Law. Section on Law and Sports Award, Dion Kohler, University of Baltimore School of Law. Section on Law Libraries and Legal Information Award, Janet Snyder, Brooklyn Law School. Section on Law, Medicine and Healthcare Distinguished Community Service Award, Lindsay Wiley, University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. Section on Law Professors with Disabilities and Allies High Feldblum Award, Robin Powell, University of Oklahoma College of Law. Section on Legal Writing, Reasoning and Research Award, Sue Lemer, Elon University School of Law. Section on Litigation Practitioner Award, Catherine Fort, Michigan State University College of Law. Section on Litigation Scholar Award, Donna Shestowski, University of California, Davis School of Law, and Scott Dodson, University of California, College of the Law, San Francisco. Section on Minority Groups Impact Legacy Award, Penelope Andrews, New York Law School. Section on Minority Groups Derek A. Bell Jr. Award, Ngozi Okitaba, Boston University School of Law. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Excellence in Pre-Law Advising Award, Lori LaPointe, University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Programmatic Organizational Changemaker Award, Suffolk Law School Pre-Law Achievers Network, Suffolk University Law School. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Unsung Hero Award, Gayla Jacobson, City University of New York School of Law. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Up and Comer Award, Danielle Saavedra, Texas Tech University School of Law. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice, Access to Justice Award, Becky T. Konkar, Tulane Law School. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice Emerging Leader Award, Darcy Meals, Georgia State University College of Law. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice Lifetime Achievement Award, Katherine Green Burnett, South Texas College of Law, Houston. Section on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Issues 2024 Individual LGBTQ Plus Inclusive Excellence Award, Libby Adler, Northeastern University School of Law. Section on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Issues 2024 Institutional LGBTQ Plus Inclusive Excellence Award, Stetson University College of Law. Section on Student Services Peter N. Kudalakis Award, Nancy Benavidez, Florida State University College of Law. Section on Taxation Lifetime Achievement Award, J. Clifton Fleming, Brigham Young University J. Reuben Clark Law School and Patricia Kane, Santa Clara University School of Law. Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education Award, Dan Lina, Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education Inaugural Technology and Ethics Award, Jessica DiPirio Whitman, University of Connecticut School of Law, and Kathleen Brown, Charleston School of Law. Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education Technology Mentorship Award, Dennis Kennedy, Michigan State University College of Law, and Kristen Davis, Stetson University College of Law. Section on Torts and Compensation Systems Prosser Award, Kenneth S. Abraham, University of Virginia School of Law. Section on Women in Legal Education Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award, Martha Minow, Harvard Law School. Well, that's really uh, outstanding. I'd say uh, one collective round of applause for, for all those winners. So the, for the second year, 
the ALS section on pro bono and access to justice has organized a pro bono honor roll to recognize law school faculty, staff, and students who have demonstrated dedication to pro bono efforts. You can find the list of ALS pro bono honor roll recipients by school in your program. If any of the recognized individuals are with us today, we ask that you stand and be recognized. ALS would also like to recognize our Teacher of the Year Award winners, who you can also find listed in our program. Law School Teachers of the Year are exceptional faculty members nominated by their peers for excellence in teaching and contributions to their law schools. If any Teacher of the Year winners are present, we ask that you stand now to be recognized. We have two additional awards jointly presented by several ALS sections. First, to present the 2024 Deborah L. Rohde Award, I'd like to welcome to the stage April M. Barton, Dean and Professor of Law at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law of Duquesne University. April. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mark just said, I'm April Barton. I'm the very proud dean of Duquesne University's Thomas R. Klein School of Law. Over the past year, I had the honor of serving as the chair of the section on leadership. And in that capacity, I was privileged to serve on the selection committee for the Deborah L. Rohde Award. Deborah Rohde had an enormous impact on law and legal education. She was the Ernest W. McFarland Professor of Law and the director of the Center on the Legal Profession at Stanford Law School. Professor Rohde also served as president of the Association of American Law Schools in 1998, was founding president of the International Association of Legal Ethics in 2010, and was the author of 30 books in the areas of leadership, professional responsibility, and gender law and public policy. The Deborah L. Rohde Award is awarded annually to honor her contributions, service, and leadership. The award is now presented by four sections in which Deborah Rohde made a significant impact. The sections on leadership, pro bono and service opportunities, professional responsibility, and women in legal education. The award is bestowed upon a legal academic or lawyer who exemplifies the groundbreaking work, imagination, inspired action of Deborah Rohde during her life and career. The selection committee received many compelling nominations in support of an array of legal educators who carry on Professor Rohde's legacy. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the committee, Eliza Vorenberg at Roger Williams, who chaired the committee, Sandy Buhai at LMU Loyola Law, Victoria Hahnemann at Creighton, and Tiffany Graham at Toro Law. And I must thank the amazing Shannon Leonard of AALS for compiling the numerous nominations and keeping us on track and organized. I'd also like to thank the following colleagues who helped establish this award in honor of Professor Rohde in 2021. Donald Polden at Santa Clara, Susan Bissom Rapp at Cal Western, Paula Schaefer at University of Tennessee, and Susan Schechter at UC Berkeley. This year, the selection committee is honoring two very deserving individuals with this award. The first recipient of the Deborah L. Rohde Award is Professor Penelope Andrews from New York Law School. I will bar, yay! <laughs> I will borrow from several of the letters of nomination we received in support of Professor Andrews to just give you a sense of her remarkable accomplishments and why she is such a deserving recipient. Professor Andrews' career exemplifies the kind of groundbreaking work and inspired action this award is intended to honor. Penelope Andrews is a distinguished and prolific human rights scholar who has been breaking down deeply entrenched barriers throughout her entire life. Born into apartheid in South Africa, Penny became the first student of color at the University of Natal in Durban, South Africa, where she earned a BA in economic history and an LLB. After receiving a scholarship to earn an LLM at Columbia Law School, Professor Andrews set off to have one of the most impressive careers in legal academia. 
Penny has achieved numerous firsts. In 2012, she became the first woman to become president and dean of Albany Law School. In 2016, she returned to South Africa, tearing down a once unimaginable barrier to become the first black dean at the University of Cape Town Faculty of Law. Not too long after that, she became the first black person to become the president of the Law and Society Association. Her reach has been so significant that she even has an award named after her at the University of KwaZulu-Natal Faculty of Law. In 2005, the school inaugurated the Penelope E. Andrews Human Rights Award. Of course, Professor Andrews has herself received numerous accolades and honors, far too many to list in our allotted time. She has written remarkable scholarship, led multiple legal organizations, organized many international conferences, taught thousands of students, and mentored scores of new academics, all while actively building fellowship and community within the legal academy and creating opportunities for those historically excluded from the profession. She is currently the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law at New York Law School, where she also directs the school's Racial Justice Project and the South Africa Reading Group. Please join me in congratulating Professor Penelope Andrews. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got three minutes, so and I really want to honor that. So I'm going to do two things: just say thank you and talk a little bit about Deborah Rodi and her impact. So thank you for that very generous introduction. Thank you to the uh, members of the four sections uh, that nominated me and members of the selection committee. I really am grateful to you. Uh, to have my name associated with Deborah Rohde in this way is such an enormous honor. Uh, she was a, a tremendous scholar, advocate, and also a colleague who inspired, influenced. So I really am very, very honored to be associated with her. I want to thank the many uh, friends and colleagues in this room, uh, including those of you who nominated me. You have supported me inspired and influenced my work. You have encouraged me during difficult times and celebrated with me during the joyous ones. I know many of you who should also be standing here because you too epitomize what this award means and I, I, I just received an award with a minority section and felt exactly the same, the wonderful people in this community, so thank you. My dean is not here, I did want to thank him for his support um, and I also want to take a minute to congratulate Professor Je Jefferson, uh, my co-recipient of this award. I am delighted to be in your company and then others who have received and will be receiving awards, Angela, Mike, and others. And uh, to the AALS President, Mark Alexander, for your leadership of the AALS over the past year. In South Africa, at the end of remarks of welcome and thanks, we also add, and I'll do this, all protocol observed. So Deborah Rohde was an exceptional human being who lived up to the promise that she demonstrated early on in her life. Uh, one example was a snippet that Dean Erwin Chemerinsky disclosed last year at this award, namely that he and Deborah attended the same high school in Chicago and that they were on the debating team. As it happens, Attorney General Mary Garland was also on that team. Deborah utilized her many talents and her legal skills in a way that benefited marginalized people, especially women and racial minorities, in the service of humanity, in other words. She therefore epitomized for me the idea of Ubuntu, the idea of our interconnected humanity. Her creative and unrelenting spotlight on legal ethics, as demonstrated by the many books, articles, lectures, and other participatory product, projects, no doubt improved and enriched the legal profession and influenced legions of law students, legal academics, 
and legal practitioners. Because of this ghastly moment in history in which I, we find ourselves, and in which our default position is often cynicism and despair, I feel compelled to end on an optimistic and hopeful note by focusing on the impact of Deborah's work, her prolific scholarship and advocacy on behalf of those previously excluded from American institutions. When Deborah entered Yale Law School, she was one of a handful of women in the law school classroom. When she started teaching at Stanford Law School, as one of only two female professors there, she faced tremendous challenges. But she persisted in confronting and slowly changing the insidious ways that discrimination against women and racial minorities remained, despite the lofty ideals of the Constitution. But if one peruses the legal academy today, and this is my optimistic note, you will see that women are outnumbering and outperforming male students in the classroom. The number of female law professors and those who are members of racial minorities have increased substantially. The number of law school deans and other administrators who are female and or people of color has grown considerably. There is still much work to be done, and I do not wish to minimize the extent of that work but we should take a moment to applaud what Deborah Rohde set out to do and really what has been achieved. Her spirit and her practical deeds should inspire us to continue and to keep on keeping on. Thank you. Congratulations, Penny. The second equally deserving recipient of the Deborah L. Rohde Award is Renee Kanaki Jefferson from the University of Houston Law Center. Allow me to share with you the words of several of her nominators to, who explain why Professor Kanaki Jefferson is so worthy of this award. When Deborah Rohde passed away suddenly in January of 2021, Renee Kanaki Jefferson was chair of the AALS section on professional responsibility, and it fell to her to announce the tragic news. Renee counted Deborah among her closest mentors and friends, a relationship sparked by Renee's visit as a scholar in residence at Stanford Law School in 2015. Professor Kanaki Jefferson exemplifies the groundbreaking work, imagination, and inspired action of Deborah Rohde in four different fields, access to justice, gender inequality, leadership, and legal ethics. Renee Kanaki Jefferson is a prolific scholar. To date, Renee has written five books, as well as, as over 30 law review articles and book chapters, more than a dozen op-eds. She appears regularly on media outlets, including MSNBC, National Public Radio, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. Renee is a Doherty Chair in Legal Ethics and a Professor of Law at the University of Houston Law Center. Prior to that, she held the Foster Swift Professorship of Legal Ethics at Michigan State University. She is a board member for the 65 Project, a nonpartisan organization with the mission to hold lawyers involved in the 2020 election fraud litigation accountable to their professional conduct obligations. She also serves on the board of the International Association of Legal Ethics, an organization Deborah Rohde founded. In 2019, Renee was appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer to serve on the Michigan State University Board of Trustees. Just like Professor Rohde, Renee Kanaki Jefferson grounds her teaching and scholarship in the real world through her work in bar service and volunteer work. She serves as a co-reporter for the American Bar Association Presidential Commission on the Future of Legal Services and on the State Bar of Michigan 21st Century Law Project Task Force. Renee currently is a member of the Texas Access to Justice Commission Working Group on Access to Legal Services, appointed in early 2023. A Fulbright recipient, an elected member of the American Law Institute, she regularly consults on matters related to lawyer and judicial ethics. She has testified before Congress about judicial recusal and before the federal judici judiciary about reform to sexual harassment and workplace misconduct rules. At the same time, Renee often works quietly behind the scenes to mentor others, much in the same way Deborah was a mentor to her and countless others. Please join me in congratulating Professor Renee Kanaki Jefferson. Thank you. 
thank you so much, April, for that kind introduction. And Penny, thank you for your beautiful remarks about Deborah. You know, we didn't talk ahead of time to see if we would overlap at all, um, but really your remarks are just a perfect introduction to her and this award and what I'm about to share, which is a little bit more personal. Um, I also want to thank the sections on leadership, pro bono and service opportunities, professional responsibility, and women in legal education for this award, both for um, the fact that Penny and I are co-recipients this year, but also coming together to honor Deborah in this way. And of course, I want to thank Professor Gina Warren, who is my colleague and dear friend at the University of Houston, who helped bring my nomination forward, and all of the people who wrote letters on my behalf. While we're not talking about the Michael Olivas Award yet, I do have to note that it's because of him, Gina Warren and I joined the University of Houston the same year. He chaired the appointments committee and brought us together. He not only gave me a, a boost in my professional trajectory, he gave me a dear colleague and best friend, and actually he also improved my love life. Um, I started dating and married my now husband, Wallace Jefferson, who is here as well, and I want to thank him for his support. So I, I have to say, receiving this award is a very bittersweet moment for me. While I, of course, appreciate having my work recognized in this way, I wish Deborah was here celebrating this moment with us rather than receiving a name in her award, or an award in her name, because she left us much too soon. I first met Deborah in 2010, but I knew her well long before that from reading her. As a junior scholar, it seemed everywhere I turned, she was there, no matter how disjointed my scholarly pursuits might have appeared to an outsider. I veered from legal ethics to access to justice, to lawyer speech in the First Amendment, to gender inequality. She was the unifying thread in my scholarly development. Some of you know about my book, Shortlisted Women in the Shadows of the Supreme Court, and that it required a decade of research going through presidential archives and uh, libraries and histories of these trailblazing women who had been shortlisted for the court before Sandra Day O'Connor. Now this work was transformative for me, even though many of those women are no longer with us. They really became some of my most profound mentors as I combed through their personal papers and their letters, and when I confided this to Deborah over drinks at a double ALS meeting in uh, San Francisco, she had a glass of beer with ice in it, her signature happy hour beverage. You know, I, I told her, you know, Deborah, some of my best mentors are dead, and we laughed about it at the time. I did not expect her to join them. The first time I saw Deborah speak in person, it was at the Australian gathering of the International Legal Ethics Conference in 2008. Two years later, she hosted that conference in 2010. She was the founder of the International Association of Legal Ethics, and that's when we finally met in person. And she agreed to come out and speak at an event at Michigan State University where I was on faculty at the time. She again returned to Michigan two years later for our symposium on gender and pipeline to power in 2012. And during those early years, she was a tremendous mentor. She would offer frank comments on drafts. She wrote letters to support my promotions to become a tenured full professor. And in 2015, she invited me to spend my sabbatical with her out at Stanford. And that's when we became friends. We walked her puppy Stanton every Thursday, discussing our latest research and writing projects. She hosted me and my kids to swim in her pool, and she included me in endless scholarly talks and events across the Stanford campus, but throughout the, the Bay Area community. It was a magical sabbatical. It seeded and fueled the very work that I am now being honored for in this award in her name. One of the most important lessons I learned from Deborah was always to combine work with quality time among friends. And as a consequence, one of my favorite memories of her is from a double ALS meeting here in DC. We dashed out in between sessions. She was presenting in one and I was presenting in another. And we went to do some shopping. Our aim was to find her a pair of skinny jeans at Nordstrom with another one of our legal ethics colleagues, Michelle Stefano. And my task was to make sure we got her back in time for her presentation. Should be simple enough, right? But we lost her and we looked everywhere. We couldn't find her anywhere. And she ended up 
Uh, long story short, she was trapped in the dressing room at Nordstrom with the lock malfunction, and she couldn't get her out. We, we couldn't get her out. She, um, if you knew her, she was quite slight, so she managed to shimmy underneath the locked door. We got her back to uh, her double ALS panel on time. No one knew. If we were honoring her memory fully today, we would duck out after this award ceremony for a walk among the monuments or to explore an art museum or catch a show or maybe shop for denim. It's an impossible endeavor to appropriately capture what it means to receive an award honoring the icon of the intellectual fields in which I strive to make a meaningful contribution. Someone who, over the years, and especially in her last years, became one of my best friends. The anniversary of her death is approaching. It will be three years on January 8th. And while I didn't plan it, as it turns out, I have a new book coming out, La Democratize, The Blueprint for Solving Justice, which is dedicated in her memory and it will hit the shelves on January 9th, which seems fitting. Deborah understood the power of authenticity in relationships, and she taught me that the lived experience is worthy of scholarly inquiry. That's something that I now try to pass on to my own students in a writing seminar that I teach at the University of Houston each year on gender, power, law, and leadership. And toward the end of her life, Deborah shared writing that was especially vulnerable, and so I'll conclude my remarks now with a line from a draft that she wrote for a Fordham Law Review Symposium. Here's what she said. Because when I have thought, as I have too often during the months preceding the symposium, about my own memorial service, I know that part of what I would want said is that she tried to think about others. I'm the recipient of this important double ALS award in her name because she did exactly that. And I hope her words inspire all of us to think about others too as we create our own legacies. Thank you all so much. Still want to know, did you get the skinny jeans or not? <laughs> Two pair. Two pair. So congratulations, uh, Penny, Renee. It's just oh, it's such a joy to be in this position that I'm in, to see all of my colleagues. I'll just share one thing I'm seeing uh, literally from my position. It's a real joy to see folks in the audience getting so excited about their colleagues. What a, what a great, great job we have. Really great. Um, so we thank you for your great work. We know you're going to continue to build upon Deborah Rohde's uh, great work of her own in helping us find new and exciting ways to benefit our profession, to benefit Legal Academy. So we have one final award this afternoon, actually, and it'll come in two parts. Um, the Michael A. Olivas Award for Outstanding Leadership in Diversity and Mentoring in the Legal Academy. This award honors the legacy of former ALS president and University of Houston Law Center professor Michael A. Olivas and his dedication to cultivating and mentoring minority and women faculty. To present the award, I would like to welcome to the stage Professor Fatma Marouf from Texas A&M University School of Law. honored today to present the Michael A. Olivas Award for Outstanding Leadership in Diversity and Mentoring in the Legal Academy. This award serves as a memorial to Professor Michael Olivas, who died in 2022 after a distinguished career, most recently as William B. Bates Distinguished Chair in Law Emeritus at the University of Houston and the Director of the University of Houston's Institute for Higher Education Law and Governance. He was awarded the 2019 ALS Triennial Award for Lifetime Service for Legal Education and the Law, the association's highest honor. He was an elected member of the American Law Institute and the National Academy of Education. 
Professor Oliva served as president of ALS after serving on its executive committee and as interim president of University of Houston downtown. He was a renowned scholar and teacher, as well as an administrative leader and community servant. In addition to his outstanding teaching and scholarship, Professor Olivas was perhaps best known for encouraging and mentoring minority and women faculty and aspiring faculty, as well as for his dedication to diversifying the legal academy. Today, we are so grateful to have Michael's wife, University of Houston education professor Tina Reyes with us for the presentation of the award. Thank you for joining us today. The selection committee for the Olivas Award received many compelling nominations in support of an array of legal education leaders who very effectively carry on much of Michael's legacy. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the other members of the committee, Patricia Jones Winograd of LMU Loyola Law, Jeffrey Dodge of Penn State Dickinson Law, Miranda Johnson of Loyola Law Chicago, and Jason, Jason Gilmer of Gonzaga Law. I'd also like to thank Dean Anthony Verona from Seattle University School of Law for leading the efforts last year to establish this award in honor of Michael. Today, we are honoring two law professors who have exemplified Michael Olivas' commitment to creating a new generation of diverse leaders in the legal academy. Their mentorship has had a life-changing impact on countless students and aspiring academics. Through their leadership and innovative endeavors, they have made the legal academy a more inclusive environment. By lifting up underrepresented voices, they have transformed the discourse of legal academia and clinical legal education. And they have done all of this while writing incredibly impactful scholarship on racial and social justice. First, we'd like to recognize Angela Nwachi Willig, Dean and Ryan Roth Gallo, and Ernest J. Gallo Professor of Law, Boston University School of Law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have to apologize in advance because I was told six minutes and like many law professors I then took the liberty to add two more minutes. So um, I want to start by thanking the selection committee chaired by Professor Fatma Marouf for selecting me to receive this incredible honor, the Olivas Award. It's absolutely amazing to be recognized in this way and it's incredibly gratifying to be receiving this honor alongside Professor Michael Pinard a White House champion of change who has had a tremendous impact on ensuring greater fairness and justice within the criminal legal system and who has played an important role in shaping legal education through his own mentoring and interventions on behalf of so many in the legal academy. Even more so, it is humbling to accept this award because of the extraordinary scholar, teacher, accidental historian, as Eddie Berto Roman would say, activist, mentor, friend, and person that Michael was. Michael literally helped to change the face and heart of the legal academy. In fact, all of higher education through his scholarly work, his activism, and his mentoring. Michael's Dirty Dozens list, which identified law schools that did not have a single Latinx professor on their faculties, placed a spotlight on the deficits in these schools, ultimately pushing them and other schools to add much needed racial and ethnic diversity to their faculties. Creating such a list was a courageous move for which Michael suffered repercussions throughout his career, despite his enormous talents and his well-earned stature within the academy. These and other sacrifices really make Michael, made him a hero to so many of us. But Michael's impact did not end there. He also built deeper pathways to opportunity for the generations that would follow him. In one of his articles, Michael critiqued the language of pools and pipelines often used in admissions discourse, calling them inapt metaphors. He asserted, quote, a pool is static. It requires restocking and resupply, and if it overflows, it bounds. It is no longer a pool. Most crucially, it can become stagnant and unusable without fresh water. It cannot replace itself. A pipeline is an even worse metaphor, though I acknowledge its widespread use and recognition value. A pipeline is a foreign mechanism introduced into an environment, an unnatural device, 
used to leach valuable products from the earth. Pipelines do not produce anything of value. They only carry or convey products. On the other hand, Michael explained, a river, quote, is an organic entity, one that can be fed from many sources, including other bodies of water, rain, and melting snow. It can be diverted to create tributaries without altering its direction or purpose, feeding streams, canals, and fields without diminishing its power. A river provides nutrients and conveys resources, and it creates demand through its dynamic flow and natural organic properties. It constantly changes form, seeking new flows and creating new boundaries. It can even wear down a rock. Throughout his career, Michael helped to replenish and strengthen such rivers in ways that extend, extended beyond the walls of law schools. For instance, Michael played a key role in designing the DACA program, and he co-drafted the Texas 10% plan with a state representative, leaving many impacts across and through many generations. In the Legal Academy, Michael worked to feed and sustain the new river flows of law faculty of color as they sought to enter the professoriate and as they actually entered it. I was one of hundreds of professors who benefited directly from Michael's kindness in this respect, and my story illustrates exactly how generous he was. When I was a young professor, perhaps in my first five years, Michael reached out to me on his own without my request or any efforts to discuss an essay that I had recently published. From my standpoint, it was generous of him to even read my work, much less reach out to me to support me and even offer advice. And though he never said it, I appreciated that he took the initiative to reach out to me because my intimidated self would have never done so without serious conjoling. After all, Michael was a giant, sort of like the godfather in our community. And I suspect that he made a point of intentionally reaching out to me and other juniors precisely because he knew we would not find the courage to do so otherwise. And because of that outreach, I later sent Michael drafts of my work for feedback and comments, and he kindly obliged, providing extensive comments, great ideas, and encouragement. For all of these reasons, I am thankful, thankful for Michael Levos, grateful for his mentorship, his bravery, his example, his love of music, which I also love, and the continued nourishment he brings to all of our lives through the rivers he helped to feed, refresh, replenish, and redirect, rivers whose strengths also came to me through the mentoring and support of others. And I would like to thank a number of these colleagues and friends, all of whom have been important mentors, teachers, collaborators, friends, and supporters to me. So first I want to thank my amazing colleagues and friends, Jasmine Gonzalez-Rose and Vinay Harpalani, who I learned nominated me for this incredible honor. I also want to thank my equally awesome uh, colleagues, Ellen Frentzen, Adam Krickerberg, and Dana Tucky for their roles in helping um, with the nomination. And I'm touched by their thoughtfulness and fortunate to have the opportunity to work with them, to learn from them. They are amazing, wonderful colleagues, as are all my BU colleagues, and I thank them as well. Additionally, I owe a million thanks to Kevin Johnson, who I hope will stand. He was the inaugural recipient of the Michael Olivas Award. <laughs> Kevin was one of Michael's many mentees, and to use Michael's river metaphor, Kevin is one of the tributaries that has fed streams and canals and fields like me and many of my peers in the academy. Last year, when Kevin received the Olivas Award, he spoke about how important Michael was to him and his career in life. And the truth is that Kevin Johnson is my Michael Olivas. I could not have had the career I've had without Kevin. Whether I was looking or completely unaware, Kevin was always so generously guiding me, protecting me, sponsoring me, teaching me, particularly during the early parts of my career. And I thank you, Kevin, for your mentorship, your support, and the many lessons you've taught me that I just in turn share with others. I'm very fortunate that you saw something special in me when I was on the market, and I'm grateful for the faculty of incredible mentors that you built at UC Davis Law. Everyone at Davis taught me so much, and I thank you and them, including Evelyn Lewis, Al Brownstein, Madhavi Sunder, Anupam Chander, Tom Zhu. Really, it's a very, very long list of people, and I do not have time to name them. I want to express my deep gratitude to my besties, Catherine Smith, Mario Barnes, and Tamara Lawson for their mentorship, friendship, and support. I'm so lucky to be surrounded by your brilliance, absolute brilliance, and your love and loyalty. And I want to thank an amazing group of women who have been, all become family to me, the Yarborough women, 
a group of women of color deans who have taught me so much over the past five years and without whose support I could not thrive or even survive in this work. I am particularly grateful to my anti-racist clearinghouse sisters, including my dear friends Danielle Conway and Kim Mutcherson, and my longtime friends Dana Matthew and Marcelin Burke and Sada Seti. And I'm grateful for other mentors like former BU Provost Jean Morrison, LSAC President Kelly Testy, President Radar Kington, former President of Grinnell College, and um, um, Professor Frank Rudy Cooper, President and former law deans Gary Jenkins, Song Richardson and Vin Trujillo, Dean John Manning, uh, law firm partner Arthur Telligan, and BU Law alumni like Ryan Roth Gallo, Chief Justice Rebecca Martinez, Rick Godfrey, Tom Gomes, Tony Gomes, and John Ward. Of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my most cherished academic family over the past 17 years, the Ludi A. Lytle family. Each year, I look forward to seeing you, learning from you, and recharging from your glow, your accomplishments, your brilliance, your beautiful spirits. I'm particularly grateful to many of the OGs, including Peggy Smith, Tajania Henderson, Ebony Nelson, Lolita Buckner Ennis, Natasha Martin, Jacqueline Bridgman, Dean Mom. Uh, the list is also very long, and I do not have enough time to thank everyone, but thank you, thank you so much to my Ludi family. Second to last, but certainly not least, I give my sincerest thanks and love to my family. My mom, who is an amazingly strong woman who worked miracles throughout my childhood, and without whom I cannot be here today. I thank my wonderful children, Elijah, Bethany, and Solomon, who inspire me each day. And I want to thank the smartest person I know, um, my very bestest friend, my co-conspirator, my partner for nearly 33 years. Are we really that old? Um, the love of my life, Jacob Bulaganwachi. Like Professor Tina Reyes, Michael's wife and lifelong love, you, Jacob, have made all that I do in my career and life possible. Um, I love you and I thank you for each and every day. And um, finally, I want to thank the AALS, particularly all five of the sections involved for recognizing Michael's legacy and impact with this award and for placing such high value on the important but difficult and highly reward, <laughs> important and difficult but very highly rewarding work of mentoring. Thank you. The second recipient we would like to honor today is Michael Pinard, Francis and Harriet Iglehurt Professor of Law, University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. Oh, thank you. Can I start with the person who I don't want to thank? <laughs> and that's whoever chose to put me after Angela. Start with that. <clears throat> but, um, but I also uh, <clears throat> like to thank the five AALS sections that uh, present this award. I want to thank uh, whoever nominated me to take the time out of your day to scribble a few words. I really um, am appreciative. I want to thank my colleagues at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law, for all their support in, in, in this matter, as well as everything that I do. I particularly give a uh, thank you to uh, our fabulous dean, Renee Hutchins. <clears throat> for all of her excellence and exuberance, uh, thank my family. I need to thank my family first, because otherwise it's a problem. Um, <clears throat> my wife, Carla, and my son, Julian, who, who couldn't be here, but really for, for keeping me on my toes and, and keeping me in, in check. I want to salute um, Angela. It's just, it's always a, a privilege to be in her presence, let alone to have my name next to her. And so I'll forever be 
be grateful. Um, and Angela is part of the crew, right, that we call the sister deans. Renee is one of them as well. And, you know, it's really, really important that we stand as a barrier between these particular deans and the nonsense, right? I um, thank, obviously, uh, Michael Levis, um, the incredible legacy. And Angela beautifully spelled it out. But the scholarship, the lawyering, the clients that he represented, the service, the activism inside and outside the academy, and um, the leadership. And in many ways, Professor Levis's legacy parallels the legacy of Charles Ogletree, who we lost um, a few months ago. And uh, in the late 80s, when I was an undergrad student and law school was a distant dream, right? It wasn't really tangible. I saw Professor Ogletree in these Fred Friendly seminars on public television. And uh, it changed my life, right? These hypothetical scripts with these luminaries like Calvin Butts and C. Everett Coop and K. Waddleton and Anthony Lewis and Peter Jennings, among others, right? These hypothetical seminars that he would run. And Charles Nesson and Arthur Miller did so as well, but Way Tree did it really grabbed me. And that's the person who I felt like I could touch, right, from the TV to say law school is the place for me. And um, years later, probably about 12 years later, I went at my very first AAS conference. It was a clinical conference. I was a fellow at the time, and I was introduced to him. A brief 30-second conversation, right? Um, and it meant everything to me. And then about three or four months later when I was on the market, um, and you know, no one was really telling me about how to navigate the market. I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, a mutual acquaintance suggested that I have a conversation with Tree. And I thought it was the most ridiculous, preposterous suggestion because I didn't know him. And I felt, how would a lion of the bar, right, this absolute legend, even want to spend any time with me? Um, so I nixed it. I said, don't even, just, just, I'm going to act like you didn't even say that to me. <laughs> um, lo and behold, he reached out and Tree um, provided his home number for me to call, right? Remember, home phone numbers, right? The phone in the kitchen <laughs> that you share with your family, right? It's not like these cell phones, these impersonal cell phones. The bottom line is, I had a comment. He spoke to me for about an hour. He asked me where I'm from and where I grew up and why I wanted to get into law teaching and then told me how to navigate this market. And it meant everything to me. And it really brought home the obligation to lift as we climb. And if Tree could do that, for someone who he never taught, right, didn't really know, then who are we not to do that, right? And at Maryland, it was reinforced by Tanya Banks, Larry Gibson, Sherilyn Eiffel. Right? Again, this is something that is an obligation that's just in the air, if you will. Um, so it is nice to get this award. Um, but you know, everyone here mentors in their own ways, and we know that there's a selfishness involved. That is, we get a lot out of mentoring these folks who we want to join us in the academy and mentoring our students as well. Right? We want to see people thrive because it makes us stronger, it makes us feel good, it makes us proud, right? So again, it's nice to get this obligation. I'm sorry, this award, I'm sorry, but this is an, this is an obligation. So we owe it to, um, to the younger folks who are in the academy. We owe it to those who want to enter the academy to be there for them. We owe it to our institutions, we owe it to our communities, we owe it to this profession in which we are woefully underrepresented, and we owe it to ourselves. Right? So this award for me is a reminder of the work, 
that we need to continue to do inside the academy, but also a reminder of the work we need to do outside of our schools, in the communities that have raised us, that have nurtured us, that have protected us, and that continue to love us. So thank you. Congratulations again, Professor Pinard, Dean Anwachi Willig, and all of the award recipients honored today. Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate your colleagues, our colleagues, to celebrate their excellence and to celebrate excellence in legal education. This concludes our 2024 ALS award ceremony. Please enjoy the rest of the annual meeting.